Hi, my name is Kieran Kennedy, Education Training Officer for West Midlands Ambulance Service NHS Trust. Today I'm going to be talking you through the cardiovascular system assessment and today I've got Aaron here who's going to be my simulated casualties. We talked through the assessment tools of inspection, palpation and auscultation. Okay, and so today then you come in with a little bit of shortness of breath. Now in order for me to identify a potential underlying cause, um, is it possible for you to remove your shirt so I can undertake a cardiovascular system exam? Is that alright? Thank you. Now the cardiovascular system exam goes hand in hand with the respiratory system exam and because the two are so closely linked symptoms we need to make sure that if you have a patient with some form of shortness of breath that not only do you do a respiratory system exam but you also undertake a cardio exam and vice versa. When you do your respiratory system exam the four key assessment tools are inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation. With this assessment, there is nothing to percuss. So we're going to be looking at inspection, palpation, and auscultation only. Right, Alan, what I want to do is I'm just going to have a stand at the base of the bed. Now, when we did the respiratory system exam, we looked for rate, depth, effort, noise, smell. We used uh, the look for accessory muscle use. Now, for the cardio exam, we're looking to identify any additional sort of pacemaker sites, which normally sit quite high up on the left anterior border of the chest wall. We'll also look for things like cabbage scars, so coronary artery bypass graft scars, which normally sit straight down the centre of the sternum. And we'll also be noting for any indications of cyanosis or GTN patches that the patient might have. We're also going to make sure we inspect both the front, the sides and the back. So if you can just lean forward for me, Aaron, that's brilliant. Thank you. That's brilliant. We're now going to look for jugular venous pressure. Jugular venous pressure is where there is a rise in the pressure associated with the right atrium. When blood returns from the head into the right atrium, if the right atrium is under pressure and can't eject that blood fully into the right ventricle and out through the pulmonary trunk, then we're going to see an elevated pressure in the external jugular vein. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look for that change today. So Alan, that's brilliant, if I can just get you to turn your head to the left for me. And I'm just going to lower you back into a 45 degree angle position. So just relax there for me. Now it's important to make sure your patient is in a 45 degree angle. If you were to sit a patient up, then JVP would drop. Likewise, if you were to lie a patient down and raise their legs, JVP would increase because of the returning blood to that side of the heart. Our jugular vein normally sits in the final third of the neck aspect. So if we can imagine our chin towards the angle of the jaw and then we're going to be searching in this area for our jugular vein. Patients who have a rising JVP normally have quite prominent neck veins. In this scenario I'm just going to palpate over the sternocleidomastoid and I can see the vein appear here. When we look at the jugular vein what we're noting is two waveforms. The first waveform is when the atrium contract. The second waveform is when the ventricles of the heart contract. And that will create a very small rhythmic contraction. And what we're going to do is we're going to look to see how far that pulsation travels up the jugular vein. And we're going to measure across to our angle of Louis and we're going to identify the height. The normal height is between two and six centimeters. If it was less than two centimetres, then we'd look at the history that we've already ascertained and maybe consider dehydration as one of the causes of that. If it's elevated beyond six centimetres, then we are looking at a patient who has raised jugular venous pressure. And we'd be looking for underlying causes, more commonly heart failure. Okay, Aaron, so I'm just going to look down across. And Aaron, all I'm going to do is just have a, a look at your neck. Okay, I'm just going to look for what's known as this biphasic waveform, double waveform. Okay. And I'm just going to feel down across your sternum now. So I'm going to use my pen to draw an imaginary line. And I found the top of the waveform, which sits roughly about there. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw an imaginary line across to our pen. And we're going to utilise that as an example of our height waveform. And that's approximately three centimetres. And in this case, that would be absolutely fine. Thank you, Aaron. That's absolutely brilliant. 
So from inspection, we then move on to palpation. All I'm going to do now is just take your pulses, relax there for me. And we're comparing and contrasting both sides. If there was any form of atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis or narrowing, then you might find abnormalities in the pulse sites themselves. We'll do your carotid. But because of the risk of baroreceptor response, I'm just going to do one at a time. We could consider palpating the abdomen if we felt that the patient had an abdominal aortic aneurysm. However, if there are pulsatile masses found within the abdomen that you can clearly see, then do not palpate. If we did think that there was a problem with the aorta, we could come down and we could assess pelvic pulses or femoral pulses as they're known. We could do the back of the knee, which is popliteal. We could do pedal pulses, which are on the arch of the foot, or we could do the posterior tibial pulse, which is always found on the inner aspect, the medial aspect of the limb itself. We're going to also palpate for edema. We palpate in the lower extremities, and we're going to be trying to differentiate between what is known as pitting edema and non-pitting edema. When we palpate, we just press our thumb line in, and we release, and we'll do that on both sides. If there was fluid there, then we would call this pitting edema, and we would identify the presence of fluid, because when we remove our thumb, it would leave a thumb mark impression actually within the skin. It's a bit similar to putting your socks on, leaving them on all day, and then taking them off, and you tend to find that there is a ring uh, of elasticity around the actual foot itself. It's a very similar uh, analogy. So pitting edema would indicate that we've got some form of fluid retention. And again, your history will allow you to identify whether that's associated with heart failure or whether there is some other form of maybe kidney problem that might lead to retention of fluid. If we try and palpate the shin bones, and we've got quite a dentist to legs, then we'll be looking at what's known as non-pitting edema. Non-pitting edema is not associated with fluid, such as water, but it's associated with the removal of lymph waste. And therefore, what we'll tend to find is, we, in the elderly more specifically, you get more grossly edematist sized legs. So we've inspected, we've palpated, and now we're gonna auscultate. So we're going to auscultate the heart sounds, and we're going to auscultate specifically the heart valves. When we're listening for heart sounds, we're listening for a lub dub. The lub indicates uh, systolic contraction. The dub represents the diastolic contraction, the relaxation of the heart. When we're looking at the sounds associated with lub, then we are looking at the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. And if we're thinking about the sound associated with dub, then we're listening for the aortic and pulmonary valves. Now to identify these sites, we're going to look for the second intercostal space, just either side of the sternum. So again, find the sternal notch, come down to the angle of Louis, second rib, second intercostal space. On this side, we're going to listen to the aortic valve. We're going to come across into the second intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum, and that's the pulmonary valve. We're going to come down to the fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum, and that's our tricuspid valve. And then we're going to come down to the fifth intercostal space, microvicular line, and that's our mitral valve. Now we're going to repeat the process, <coughs> this time 
When we repeat the process, we're actually going to take the radial pulse at the same time. The reason for this is obviously when the heart contracts, it's creating pressure. That pressure is normally associated with the pulses that you feel. In some cases, in an irregular heartbeat, the ventricles may not have enough time to significantly fill, and therefore when they contract, they don't create enough pressure, and therefore we may not feel the pulse itself. So let's go and have another little scenario. Now when we hear abnormal sounds, we should only normally hear a lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. When we hear abnormal sounds, we may hear sounds such as lub dub, lub dub, or lub dub, lub dub. And all that's indicating to us that there is a problem with the valve. Now that could be something like regurgitation, so blood is actually allowed to pass back from the ventricle through into the atrium, or from the aorta itself back into the ventricle or the pulmonary trunk. In order to identify the differences between the systolic and diastolic murmur, then we're looking at where the sound is already being created. So remember, if you hear a lub and then an abnormal sound, then it's called a systolic murmur. If you hear lub dub and then an abnormal sound, then we're looking at diastolic murmur. And in order to identify which valve is associated with the problem, it's where the sound is more prominent when listening. Finally, the last thing we're going to do is have a listen for what's known as breweries. Okay? Breweries are due to atherosclerotic plaques built up in the carotid arteries. So Aaron, just keep your head nice and still for me. And when we auscultate the carotid artery here and here, we shouldn't hear any abnormal sounds. More often than not, what you will hear is breath sounds. So a good example of what to do with this scenario to actually get a good listen is actually ask your patient to take a deep breath in and just hold it. So take a deep breath in for me and hold it. And breathe out. That's lovely. And I'll let you do the same again, please, Alan. Breathe in. Hold it. And breathe out. And again, more often or not, what you will find is that you won't hear any abnormal sounds. However, when we have atherosclerotic plaques build up, the movement of blood over that airflow, uh, the movement of blood, sorry, over that plaque creates turbulence and that will maybe create some form of whooshing sound or abnormal sound. Okay, and that concludes the assessment for today. If I get you to pop a t-shirt back on. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes our cardiovascular system assessment.